Good morning. Good morning. So I, I'm glad that we're all uh, shouting because I need some feedback throughout this. So I have no slides, uh, and so you don't. If you're in the back, you're fine. Is there supposed to be? I don't think this projects. I think it's just recording. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So you just have to hear me. So I'll I'll stand close and shout loud. Um, closer still, Adam. Yeah. Okay. So this is Pride and Shame. Um, I am a software developer, but uh, I check the people who work at my firm who actually develop software because I really don't develop software very much anymore. The only thing I get to do that is like developing software is do code reviews. And I'm just curious, how many people are developers here? A lot of you, good. How many people participate in code reviews regularly? Yeah, about half. That's not bad. So what are some of the uh, ways you do code reviews today? Anyone? Crucible. Crucible, that's a nice automated tool. Pull requests on GitHub, yep. Get this on the command line. Get this on the line. So most of those are like an offline review. Does anyone do interactive reviews with someone? We just get a conference room and go through the code. Get a conference room, go, go through the code. So about how long do you, like when you say like, let's schedule a code review, how long do you block off? Uh, we try to do an hour, but we only do a chunk of the code. Yeah, yeah, an hour, but only do a chunk of the code. That's, a, that's basically what I'm gonna propose today. It, it uses a model that um, I call 10, 10, 10. So it's, it's 30 minutes of planned um, code review, but it always takes an hour, because if you plan to talk about something for 30 minutes, it, you'll, you'll have about 30 minutes of extra stuff Everyone in there. Everyone wants to talk for 30 minutes. Everyone wants to talk for 30 minutes, <laughs> right. And, and today, it's, there's only 25 minutes, so we, you know, I've got this guy uh, checking my time here to be like, hey, uh, move it forward. So um, the, the talk is called Pride and Shame, and I actually use this with clients. Uh, we did code reviews in front of clients, and uh, some of my executives suggested that I, I don't close on shame, or maybe I don't call it shame, uh, but it's a nice way to remember to look at some good stuff in code and uh, to look at some bad stuff in code. Because usually if you're doing code for production, uh, there's usually some bad stuff in there, right? Because usually there's a timeline, and we've all had a little bit of debt sneak into our code. So just uh, a reminder, sometimes if you ask developers, bring some code to review, they will bring their best code to review. And, um, and remembering to bring some code that's not so great um, can, can do a couple things for you. So the, the first thing is, yeah, an, an hour long of code, that's a nice way to get an interactive code review in. Um, but as he mentioned, you can't review all your code that way. So this is not the only way to review code. And using tools like Crucible um, or just having everyone on the project Look at code is a good idea. This doesn't replace code inspection if you're using that for quality. Um, it is just a, I think of it as a way to improve developers and less of a way to necessarily catch bugs, right? So it's about developing a voice for the developers on your team um, and, and about sharing ways of writing code and less about um, catching defects. Although sometimes you do actually catch defects with this format. So, yeah, the basics are, how do you do this? You, you sit down and you say, well, I need a room for an hour, and then you try and get people together. Um, how many people work with distributed teams? Just a couple, but that'll, and is your whole team distributed? Yeah, so if your whole team's distributed, you tend to develop a style that's distributed, and that works well. Um, you know, you can use uh, Hangouts, um, what do you use? Yeah, Jabber chat rooms, you know, anything that gets everyone participating on the same level. If you've got just one person, is there anyone who's got just one person that's remote? You've got one person that's remote? Yeah, that gets complicated for that one person. Um, do you guys do code reviews? Mostly just through pull requests. Just through pull requests, yeah. So if you want to get everyone together, the, it, it's almost helpful to have everyone be in a separate hangout than it is to get like one room with everyone together and then that one person who has a, has a less quality interaction. So yeah, but step one is get everyone in a room or get everyone on the same level playing field so that everyone has the same level of interaction. That way you don't have that one person who's off somewhere and they're not getting to participate or they're not getting to participate fully. The next thing is what code to review. And I leave this up to the individual developer. We've done this a couple different ways. Um, one way that's gotten really popular at my firm is everyone is expected to be selected for the code review, and then one person is selected, and they do it at random when they walk into the room. Um, that has the benefit, if you are getting ready for a code review, you have a tendency to have better quality code. 
um, if you know that people are going to see it, particularly if you're going to see it in front of a group like this, or even a, you know, four of your peers, they tend to know your coding style really well, and they're going to be, uh, they're going it, it, to, it's, uh, it's a higher bar. It's, I find it's even more intimidating than presenting to people I don't know, is presenting to people that I do know, because they tend to know my weaknesses, and they seize upon those weaknesses. And so, um, so I leave it up to the individual developer what they want to review, but I ask them to bring two kinds of code, right? Um, one is something they're proud of, and then one is something that I say ashamed of, but it, it's, a, it's a simpler way to think of it as bring some code that you think is worthy of other people emulating the style, and then bring some code that's given you struggles. So that could be you know, a bit of code that um, maybe it doesn't work, Although that's rare, people rarely bring code that doesn't work to code reviews. Uh, they usually make sure it works before they get up in front of everyone. But it might be something that they're like, wow, this just looks like spaghetti. It's, um, it's case ridden. I sure used that paste button a lot when I was writing this code. So it's got a lot of copy and paste code. I found this code on the internet. And uh, it seems to work, but I don't really understand it. Um, so yeah, those are some different examples of code that people are you know, ashamed of. Um, but the reason it's important to bring both examples um, is because either one can lead to interesting discussion points. right? If someone is proud of some code, but then the rest of the team looks at it and they don't understand the code, or the rest of the team looks at it and there's a lot of defects in the code, uh, then you've got one kind of problem. And that usually leads to a different kind of dialogue in the meeting, because it, really, um, it can get really awkward for people, because it's hard to give feedback when it's really terrible. Right? And you almost want to do that offline and you know, pull them aside and say, hey, can we pair maybe next week? And let's talk about the way you're approaching that problem, the part that you're really proud of. The other thing we've seen in, in the prideful section is code that's super uh, tricky. And so people are proud of it because it was hard, and then they managed to solve the problem, um, which is good. Uh, you know, I never, never put down code that, that works and, and solves the problem. But if it's tricky code, then that's, that might be an opportunity to bring in some, some refactorings or things to clean it up a bit. Um, but usually, the pride stuff is usually pretty good, right? Because people knew that they were going to be, there was a chance they were going to get selected for a code review. And then they did get selected for a code review. And so the code quality there is usually pretty good. The shameful stuff is um, you know, different. I mean, I've had guys that bring in shameful stuff, and it's still pretty good. And you're kind of like, a good question to ask at that point in the code review, is this really the worst code that is in, you know, is this really the, the, the biggest problem you have right now? And usually that will cause them to say, like, well, there is this one thing. You know, and, and they break out like a 100-line uh, method or a 100-line function that's got like eight levels of indentation and you know, three switch statements. You know, uh, and they're repeated at the top and in the middle and in the bottom and things like that. So those are good candidates for, for shameful code. Um, but the reason you want to have some shameful code is that it encourages your team to give feedback. And that's a safe place to give feedback. Most people are reluctant to criticize good code uh, on the team. And so if, you, if that person says, I know this is problematic, that gets the team willing to, to enter into that critique process, and that can improve the quality of feedback you get in, in code reviews. All right, so that's how, to set, you know, that's how long you need. That's what code to review. Uh, I did say it was 10, 10, and 10, and I kind of forgot the first part of that, which is it's hard to review code if you're not on the project. And if you're on a team that's really small, or if you are the team, it can be really hard to get into the pride and the shame, because no one understands what problem you're trying to solve. So one way we've combated that, because we have a lot of small teams in my company, um, and we don't always have enough people to form a team on that team and do a code review. So what we do is we'll have open code review formats. And in that open format, the first 10 minutes is just, what the heck are we trying to solve here? Ugh. Dry mouth. I, I always do pride first, um, but I've seen people do shame first. Uh, the benefit of doing shame first is you end on an up note, um, and you also get people in the, they get comfortable critiquing code. The only bad thing is it gets people in this mode of critiquing, and then when you hit the pride, they still bring the hammer, 
and that can make people not want to share code as much. And so um, particularly when we have optional code reviews, that we have like these open forums that someone will just host, and then people line up to come do talks like this, except they review their code. Um, you get less participation when you always are bringing the hammer and you don't bring some nice feedback as well. So it gets you, if you think about um, just giving feedback, giving feedback is hard for people. And if you, if you start with something nice, that gets you in the habit of talking about it. And then you can you know, bring some constructive criticism. Um, but I've seen both work. The one thing I would say is um, don't let it become always good code. You know, that it, it is important to look at code that's got problems. Um, because that code is there, it, it's lurk you know, if you are doing um, inspection and someone is going through and looking at all the code, you'll find that stuff. But if that's not happening for you, um, this is a good way to bring that, code, uh, bring that code to life. So the first part, the 10 minutes, what, how would you introduce someone to your code? Do um, you ever have the problem of trying to show someone around a new hire? Where do you start? I'm going to explain some code. Just dive right in. Line one. It's usually all header stuff. You know, it's not terribly exciting. Line one. Huh? What are you trying to do? Yeah. What's the, what's the problem? So usually it's not a good idea to start right into code. Usually it's a good idea to start into if the if the application's already running. It's a good idea to start to the running application. Get down to the area of the code that you're going to be reviewing. If it's, um, if it's controller logic for a particular interaction, get to that interaction. Show how, how you think it's supposed to work. If you're working from design documents, those can be useful. Um, for web projects, I've seen guys just show um, the, the, you know, the, the server tree of content. You could show um, you know, how the repository is laid out. You know where different things are, and then drill down into that code, and then kind of take people through how the code should run, and how you got to this point. And so, what what's interesting about this point of code? And that usually is five or ten minutes. So, um, you know, it, give yourself some time. Give yourself some time to explore. Again, that's ten minutes of planned, so you can run as long as twenty minutes, just getting people to understand the code base. But I'm, I'm, we're not usually on uh, twenty minutes there. It's usually about ten, and then you're jumping into. Um, the prideful part. All right, then um, as you think about participating in a code review, what are kinds of things you can talk about when you're looking at code? Syntax, okay. So is this valid syntax? Will this compile? Will this run? Ah, syntactical style. So you have a style guide that you would use. Is, um, so yeah, starting with style guides and just saying, is this code, does this code look like the code this organization produces? Do you have your own style guide or do you live on someone else's? You have your own style guide. About how big is it? Oh, okay. All right. So yeah, so use, uh, how many people know what JS Hint is? Or linting tools generally? So yeah, there are, um, you know, JS Hint is a configurable form of, of a lint tool that, let, that lets you say, um, make sure that this code follows some certain guidelines. Like we're going to always use triple equals and we're not going to use double equals. Or we're, you know, um, we're never going to, we're never going to do eval, right? You can, you can set that stuff. A lot of it came out of um, uh, JavaScript, the good parts. So, um, you know, but that, so that's an example of an internal tool that's a customization of an industry tool, right? And that's not a bad place to start. I would encourage you, if you have your own style guide, um, you know, you can use that, but you'll be better off living on industry style guides because when you get new hires, there's a better chance they'll be familiar with your style guide. So if you're a JavaScript programmer, uh, JS Hint is a you know, it's at least starting with the old Yahoo guidelines, because that's what Crockford was doing there. Um, and then if you're configuring your JS hint to be more lenient, then what you're really saying is Crockford's kind of overbearing, and uh, I can use new. It's part of the language, you know. There's a few things that you're like, oh, really? That's, that's a little too much for me. I like my style. But that's a nice, it's a quick way that you can just look at that one file see all the different defines you've got in there and say like, yeah, okay, I agree with that, I don't agree with that. Yeah? Naming conventions. 
Naming conventions is another one. Yeah, that, that is constantly a topic for us. Um, you know, we have a lot of developers. We have about 150 developers in our office. Uh, we're always hiring, by the way, vml.com. Um, so yeah, we have about 150 developers. We bring on a lot of new developers. And um, you know, a lot of young developers who maybe are still in that copy and paste phase of their career, where they're finding stuff that works, and they're slapping it in there. And so I, I'll see a lot of stuff that's literally the name of the arguments is um, whatever, was in the, whatever was in the doc, right? So they're terrible names, right? They're, it's like that it says nothing to me about the problem we're solving. And, I'll, and you know, to a lot of developers, it's like, well, it runs, right? It works. But I think a code review is an opportunity to do more than that. Um, and to try and write code that communicates clearly. And uh, I can't remember the exact saying, but someone said there's, uh, there's two hard problems in computer science. And I, I think it's like naming and recursion, right? Naming things. Are, but I don't actually remember what number two is. But I know number one's naming, right? So naming's a big deal. And, and probably people that get up in the morning on a Saturday and decide to come talk about technology, you guys are probably, probably fairly enlightened in your coding review practices, or at least in your naming practices. But yeah, what makes a good name? Um, you could even have standards around that in your organization. Um, if you're not going to, if, if your code, if you want to elevate the code discussion beyond just uh, syntax and naming, um, any other ideas? Yeah, so like books that are about style, right? So um, refactoring technically means um, you, you take code that works, and then you change the structure of the code, and the code still works. It's not supposed to do something differently. Usually when we refactor, we're, we're often refactoring and fixing. I'm not usually that um, strict, and most developers I work with aren't so strict about their refactoring where they say, I'm also never going to fix anything when I do a refactor. I mean, how many people are super strict on the refactoring? Yeah, nobody. But, <laughs> but I mean, the theory behind it is good. And the reason that makes it good for code reviews is hopefully in the code review, you're not fixing a lot of defects. And using a book like um, Fowler's Refactoring, that book does two things. One, it shows you how to change the code. And two, the more important thing is it gives that change a name. And on teams that use, say, something like the refactoring book um, regularly during code reviews, then they will start to talk about the code using those patterns. So I'll hear people say, wow, I see you're using indented control flow. Have you thought about using a guard clause? And that's awesome. Actually, that happens like once a year. Um, <laughs> right? But that's, that's where you want to go with your code reviews. You want to get to the point where you're developing a vocabulary around the patterns and the idioms that make code great, that make code expressive. So that's a really good place. Um, any other books that people think of? Uh, oh, testing. testing books or testing as a way of finding? Yeah, so looking at your tests as a way of doing a code review. Yeah, a good way, also a good way to introduce the code if you're talking about that first 10 minutes of um, you know, how does this code work. If you have tests, if you're a, you know, a test-driven developer or you're a test-first kind of person, I'm a test-reasonably-early kind of person. I'm not quite that good to be I always write tests before I write uh, functioning code. But that's a good place to jump off. Also, is this code tested? You know, um, you know, what's your coverage like? How did you achieve that coverage? Because I've seen like really gaudy coverage statistics on Rails projects, and then you look under the hood and it's all generated tests. And I was like, okay, well, you've proven that Rails works. That's good. Did you test any of your code on top of that? Um, you review implementation code and test code at the same time always? Um, I rarely review test code. Really? Um, uh, we're, we're not so good about writing tests all the time. Um, but if we had a lot of tests, Right? Then I, I work at an ad agency, so uh, people don't die when you run our software. Um, you know, I mean, if, if we do sign like a medical company, they don't usually let us touch like, like I'm a diabetic and I've got my insulin pump in my pocket and I, I sleep easy at night knowing I didn't write this code. <laughs> but yeah, if I, if, I, you know, um, if I was writing medical control stuff, I would probably test a little bit more 
um, directly. But yeah, when you're doing financial transactions, we do have some clients that let us do their financial transactions. And then you do want to have more tests in there. So um, yes, I don't care. Um, and again, this format is just for kind of raising the quality of coding for developers, right? And getting your team to code the same way. So if someone wants to review their test code, let's do it. That's a good place. Um, some other good places to find um, kinds of things to talk about. Um, refactoring is a section of it that, uh, so that was Fowler's book. There's a section of it written by Kent Beck, and I'm a huge Kent Beck fan. Um, he, ha in that, that chapter is called Code Smells, which the, the subtitle under that is, it's like a diaper. If it smells, you change it. Um, but those same smells appear in, um, must be near time. Yeah. Five minutes? Okay, great. So those same smells appear in a book by Uncle Bob Martin. Uh, the, I think it's Clean Code is the title of it. So that's another place, depending upon, you know, if, if everyone on your team hates Martin Fowler, pick up Uncle Bob, right? He says different things, but both of them are talking about improving the quality of code. Um, some more mundane things, Code Complete um, by, I think it's McConnell. Um, it, you know, the original version has Pascal examples, so if anybody's still writing Pascal, you can, you can use those. But what's interesting is the same idioms that he used for Pascal and C are in the, the updated version that's like C sharp and who knows what else. I haven't read the updated version, but you know, these idioms actually work over time, and so they're worth, they're worth learning. Yeah. That's an outstanding book, yeah. So design patterns is, um, is sometimes harder for people, like coders, to get into design patterns. I'm a big design patterns fan, and reading the original book is super hard because it's, um, it was written in the, it was really written in the early 90s, and so all the examples are pre-standard template library C++, so it's old, and there's a few examples of Smalltalk, and I love Smalltalk, but nobody else does and it doesn't look like normal code to anyone else. But that book, Head First Design Patterns, um, is written, it, it's the, that whole series is great. Kathy Sierra started that series, and it talks specifically about um, the, the Patterns book, but whereas the Patterns book is just a catalog, and it's really hard to read, and it's not in a, any particular linear order, um, you know, it's, worth, it's worth struggling through. I'd say, you know, get, that, get the Head First book, and then get the design patterns book. Don't just drive into design patterns. But yeah, then you can actually talk about design idioms while you're doing code reviews. And some of them, you know, I would want to understand some of the patterns before I did a code review. If someone was using the facade pattern, that might not be too bad, right? Because it's just one layer talking to the next object. So that's not so bad. But if someone was using like the visitor pattern, which has all this like misdirection, and they, they literally refer to it as a pas de deux, which is like two dancers outdoing one another. Um, that would be, I'd want to understand that before I got into someone's visitor implementation, because that would be a little bit complicated. But that book is a good place to get your team to the point where they can talk about design patterns. I don't think I can shout over this, um, but if you do have further questions, you can hit me up. I am at David Mitchell. I did not write Cloud Atlas. Um, but uh, so I have a lot of people who follow me for the wrong reasons, but you can follow me for the right reasons. Yeah. Thank you.